So, uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Dietrich and the organizers for uh, inviting me uh, to give these lectures. And um, uh, I, I'm, I, I expect that uh, the, the audience is quite mixed. So some things that I say will be boring, at least to some people, uh, but hopefully not uh, to, to all. Um, and um, I mean, the, uh, there, there are several different sort of communities that come together in this uh, summer school and the, and the workshop. And, um, and uh, for, for the problems that, that we're interested in, I think it's, it's very important to, to, to sort of bridge the gaps between these communities because all of these uh, ideas uh, from scattering theory, from, from uh, spin geometry, from analysis, I think are, are relevant to the main problems, at least as, as I see them. <coughs> and uh, so, uh, let me, uh, so let me start by, by giving a very uh, brief uh, overview or introduction to what I, I want to say. So my, my name is Lars uh, and uh, so the the title I gave for for this for these talks is uh, is uh, geometry and, an and analysis in uh, black hole space times and this is the the what I would want to do or want to try to do is to collect some material that I think is relevant for the, the problem of uh, understanding the global evolution of space times uh, under the Einstein equations, uh, which contain a black hole. <coughs> so we're looking at some space time uh, and uh, we're looking at the Einstein field equations, which I'm more or less only going to consider the, the vacuum case. And uh, um, so vacuum means uh, that we have, a, we have a four manifold, let's say signature like that. We're looking at the Ricci flat, the equation on the metric, which is given by Ricci curvature equal to zero. And uh, if we do some gauge fixing, then we get the hyperbolic system of evolution. And, um, and so in fact, what, you, what, is, what is well known is that there is a unique maximal development So that means that if I give Cauchy data for this, uh, this evolution equation, then there is a unique up to isometry maximal global hyperbolic space time that, uh, that this uh, data set is contained in. Uh, and uh, so, so the question is, what are the properties of this uh, What are the properties of this development? And, and uh, so there are two, two big conjectures. So strong cosmic censorship says that, uh, so, these, these, uh, so this development is required to be, glo be globally hyperbolic, which I will explain. But basically that means that the sigma is a Cauchy surface and any causal, any inextendable causal curve has to cross that sigma. This is the, the condition for being globally hyperbolic. 
And strong cosmic censorship says that generic Cauchy data, in some suitable sense, leads to a maximal development which is inextendable as a, as a regular vacuum space time. So, in principle, such a development could be extendable, uh, but you can lose global hyperbolicity. <coughs> so, you can have here a null curve, for example, which which doesn't cross the, the sigma. So <coughs> the, if you don't include the property of global hyperbolicity, you lose predictability and so on. So, uh, so this, is the, uh, this is the interesting situation. Uh, and uh, not much is known about this in the general case. It's only uh, under situations with uh, high symmetry, for example what's known as Bianchi or Gaudi models, where this is known uh, to hold uh, through the work of Hans Ringström. And there are also stability results. For example, the stability of Minkowski space can be viewed as sort of verifying strong cosmic censorship in, in a certain sense. <coughs> and uh, the other conjecture is weak cosmic censorship. And uh, so what that says is that uh, a space-time which, uh, which is asymptotically flat, so it describes a, an isolated system, uh, uh, so that far away from, from the, where the field is strong, uh, you're, you're, you're essentially in empty, flat space. Uh, then in such a space-time, uh, an observer at infinity cannot see a singularity. So if you have a, a place where the space-time is incomplete, so, so you have some Cauchy data here, so you have some, some place where the space-time is incomplete, uh, that irregular part of the space-time or singularity has to be hidden from observers at, at infinity by an event horizon. So, so here is, this is the set of observers at infinity, and here is the event horizon, which hides from this observer any, uh, any event that can be uh, related to this, uh, this the, the, the bad part of the space time, the singularity. <coughs> and, um, and this is, an, uh, the, both of those are essentially completely wide open, both of these conjectures, and, and uh, there are only some, uh, some limited uh, progress. Uh, and so th this, this, uh, this, is, this weak cosmic censorship is the most relevant one for, for, for these, for uh, what I'm talking about here. <coughs> and, uh, and, and this is because of the following reason. So we look at the Kerr space-time, which is very well known. So this has, has, uh, uh, this has two parameters, A and M. M is the a mass at infinity. A is the angular momentum per unit mass. So if you multiply those, you get the actual angular momentum. Uh, uh, and it has two killing fields. d by the t and d by the phi. This is the stationary killing field. So near infinity, the norm of the killing field, of this killing field goes to minus one. And this is the axial killing field. So that describes the fact that the, the space time is axially symmetric and, and can rotate. <coughs> uh, this is algebraically special. So it's, it's Petrov type D, or, or uh, as some people prefer, 2-2. Uh, so this means that it has, there are two, repe two repeated principal null directions. And this is a, a crucially important fact uh, uh, about the Kerr spacetime that I hope to uh, spend some time talking about. Uh, and furthermore, for if you have 
modulus of a less than or equal to m, this contains a black hole. So it's, and of course, as I said, it's, it, it's asymptotically flat. So this means that if you go far away uh, from this, uh, the, the region where the field is strong, uh, the metric in Kerr tends to the flat Minkowski metric. Uh, and uh, so, <coughs> and there, there are then several, several conjectures which are related to the weak cosmic censorship. So the Kerr space-time, so this, this describes a rotating black hole. Um, and, uh, and so this is an astrophysically extremely important object. And the Kerr, space, the Kerr solution uh, to the Einstein field equation is expected to be unique under the assumption that it's, uh, at least if it's a, a non-degenerate uh, stationary black hole space-time. So this only assumes the d by dt stationarity and not the axial symmetry. That's a consequence of the uniqueness. That should be a consequence of the uniqueness theorem. And it's also expected to be stable, uh, which means that if we take some Cauchy data, which is close in some suitable sense to Kerr data, uh, the asymptotic evolution of that data should contain some, black, some Kerr black hole. Uh, and, and there is progress on the uniqueness problem. This is in the physics community, this was considered to be solved, uh, at least in the real analytic case. But uh, more recently, there's been uh, quite a bit of progress by Kleinemann and collaborators on this. Uh, uh, the stability problem is, is largely open, and, but what, what has been done is a lot of work on model problems. So this includes uh, fields, test fields on the Kerr space-time. Uh, for example, which, which are supposed to model uh, gravity. So scalar fields, Maxwell fields, uh, linearized gravity is, is, uh, is, there's been a lot of work on linearized gravity on Kerr, but from an analytical point of view, uh, not much is known. And, uh, uh, okay, uh, yes, so, and, and so, I, so I'm, I want to spend quite a bit of time uh, talking about this, the algebraically special nature of, of Kerr. And um, so that, that has several important consequences. So this is, so I should have mentioned that, I mean, we have the two killing fields. So for particles or geodesics in Kerr, this means that there are two conserved quantities and therefore you have no reason to expect that the geodesic equation is integrable. Uh, in fact, if you, in a general stationary axisymmetric space-time, uh, particle motion will be chaotic, and you, there are plenty of examples of that. So, so to analyze the fact that one can actually analyze uh, the particle motion or motion of geodesics in the curved space-time is due to this algebraically special nature because that implies the, the existence of, of the Carter constant, uh, which is, this gives a third conserved quantity for geodesics. And now you also have the fact that the length or the velocity of the geodesic is a conserved quantity. So that gives four conserved quantities in a four-dimensional space-time. And, uh, and that, means that, by you, that, that means that you can actually integrate the geodesic equation. And this, is, uh, this is sort of opens up uh, the, the problem. Uh, and this has several consequences. There is a symmetry, symmetry operator. Uh, and uh, also, uh, there is decoupling. 
And this leads to the famous Tucholsky system. And this, uh, this, both of these, all of these properties have to do with the fact that the curvature tensor in such a space-time is particularly simple. Okay, so, so this is somehow, uh, so if, if you want to do analysis in, the, in Kerr, you have to take this, you have to take all of these things into account, uh, is my point of view. And so in some sense, the message is that for, to make progress on understanding uh, weak cosmic censorship, Kerr stability and so on, one, uh, one really has to understand both uh, the, the algebraically special nature of the Kerr space-time and the techniques that one can use to do analysis in, in that setting. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so I, so I wanted to start by uh, saying something about the the uh, the evolution problem for the Einstein equations. Uh, and so, well, so we have already uh, the space-time, and uh, so. So if I have a vector, this is, which is, has negative norm, this is, I mean, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying this even though I suppose everyone actually knows this. Uh, but I have to say one, one embarrassing thing is that there are two conventions. Uh, some people use this convention. Some people uh, use the opposite convention for the signature of the metric, so that, um, that the corresponding Minkowski space uh, would, have, would have the metric d by d, d t, uh, would have the metric dt squared minus dx squared minus dy squared minus dz squared. And actually, I, I spent a lot of time worrying about this, but then I decided, uh, I'm just going to switch when it's convenient. So I, I will not try to be uh, consistent. So, so, the, so here is, and this is time-like, okay. Uh, and <coughs> now, uh, we have to introduce so this is going to be very quick so here those those directions are causal so that means that anything that's inside or on the boundary of the light cone is, uh, is causal. <clears throat> and uh, it's convenient to think about uh, just continuous curves in the space-time. And uh, such a curve is called causal if points on the curve are causally related. That means that you can connect them up by a broken differentiable uh, curve that's everywhere causal. <coughs> uh, uh, a high uh, subset uh, is a chrono if uh, there is no pair P and Q for which P is in the time-like future of Q. So the picture is something like this. So this is the, this is the, the hypersurface. Uh, sorry. And uh, here, here, let's say, is Q. And uh, then 
here is the time like future. And uh, so we're not supposed to have any points on the surface in the time like future of, of, um, of Q. And, uh, and so that, that means essentially that the, the surface is, uh, is uh, weakly space like. So the domain of dependence is the set uh, of, of some subset sigma is the set of points such that any inextendable causal curve uh, through uh, intersect sigma. So, so the picture is like this. So here is sigma, here is uh, a causal curve it, uh, in the domain of dependence, this has to, in, this has to intersect sigma, so something like this. <clears throat> and uh, an example of a space-time which is globally hyperbolic uh, but which is extendable as, as a as a globally hyperbolic, uh, uh, as a as a as a as a regular vacuum space time, is got by taking uh, the future. So this is, I take a point in Minkowski space, take the future of that. The hyperboloid is a Cauchy surface. So this is, this would be T equals square root of rho squared plus R squared or something like that. <clears throat> in Minkowski space, uh, this is globally hyperbolic. This is a Cauchy surface. Any any uh, causal curve has to has to cross uh, sigma. But I can easily make this. I can I can extend this in many different ways. So one extension is the the maximal extension, if you like, is the Minkowski space. That's a geodesically complete space, so it cannot be extended. But I can also extend this, uh, for example, like that. That's another flat, also vacuum space time, but which is not globally hyperbolic because I can have a causal curve in there, which, uh, uh, which will not uh, allow me to have a Cauchy surface. So this is an example of a space time which has uh, many extensions <clears throat> and and where, where some of the extensions are not globally hyperbolic. So, but if we restrict to globally hyperbolic vacuum extensions, and I take data on this surface for the Einstein equation compatible with <clears throat> the flat Minkowski space, this is the unique maximal globally hyperbolic extension. Yeah. Exactly. So so th so then uh, the the in here there will be uh, 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 the boundary of the domain of dependence of sigma uh, will be this will be the the cone. So in uh, and and so that's referred to as a Cauchy horizon. So this is the the this would be uh, uh, the whole cone here. Would be the if we think of the cone sit, as sitting in Minkowski space, for example, then uh, here we have a boundary to the domain of dependence of sigma. So that's a Cauchy horizon. And there's there are lots of things to be said about uh, such things, but I don't want to s spend any time on that because I I, I want to uh, look at the 
the most sort of naive uh, and optimistic point of view. Uh, but a very important fact, uh, and that re only somewhat recently became clear, is that all, uh, so, uh, so if M is globally hyperbolic, This means that there is a, a global temporal um, and uh, so this this is important because so I'm only thinking about smooth space times so uh, but in, in a smooth space time a Cauchy surface is not necessarily smooth um, and uh, it was only recently clarified that uh, smooth globally hyperbolic space times actually can be folated and split in a, in a, in a, in a, in, 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 as a smooth diffeomorphism. So, sig so M is actually diffeomorphic to, to R cross sigma, where sigma is some Cauchy surface. And in, furthermore, there is a global temporal function. So that's a time function. So a function whose gradient is time-like and uh, whose level sets are all Cauchy surfaces. So, so globally hyperbolic spacetimes are, are well organized in that, uh, in that sense. <coughs> okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm not giving any references, but uh, I will try to uh, uh, write up some some notes eventually uh, where those references can be found. So okay, so we have uh, so from from the metric, as as everyone knows, we have the Levitivita connection, and then we have just to fix just to fix uh, conventions. Uh, so here is the, the Riemann tensor. We raise in and lower indices uh, using the metric. Uh, the Ricci tensor is like that. And the scalar curvature is the contraction of the Ricci tensor. <coughs> um, and <clears throat> and I mean, so there are several facts. So the the Bianchi identities uh, so this is just a, the, this is just a, actually the same as the, taking the cyclic sum over those indices. Uh, and also the same is true. If you take a covariant derivative, this implies, if you do a contraction, and this implies that uh, the Einstein tensor is divergence-free. So the, the, the Einstein tensor is so this is not so uh, not since I'm I'm mostly going to talk about the vacuum case so this is but these are th things that everyone should know um, okay and uh, I also want to say uh, and this is very important that uh, that the Einstein ten the, the Riemann tensor can be split Like this, so uh, so I can I can uh, take off all the traces from the Riemann tensor, and uh, so this this is the tensor which has the same symmetries as the Riemann tensor, but has all the traces vanishing. So, for example, C So and and this this tensor is called the vile. This is the vile tensor. And the very important fact is, is that if 
if the Ricci vanishes, so if, if we're in vacuum, then the Weyl tensor satisfies the, the contracted Bianchi identity. And this is, in some sense, this encodes the, the, the Einstein equation. So uh, the vacuum Einstein equation implies uh, 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 that this divergence of the Weyl tensor is zero. And this is simply, this is actually simply the, the spin two So uh, basically, this this is the crucial, in some sense, uh, the, the the crucial equation. This is a hyperbolic system. Uh, uh, the the uh, as a, as an equation for the Weyl tensor. Uh, this equation is not hyperbolic as it stands uh, as an equation for the metric. Okay. So um, uh, and. So mostly, we think about the Einstein equations coming from an action uh, so okay so uh, so this. Another uh, fact over, uh, over here, uh, the volume form is so this is simply the, the Riemannian uh, volume form calculated for the, for the, the four metric G. <coughs> And uh, so here is an action. This is the scalar curvature of the metric. And here is some matter uh, Lagrangian, which may involve some field and its derivatives, and also depend on the metric. And, uh, and so the Einstein field equations then um, are got by taking, setting uh, the, the, the variation with respect to g of this s to 0. And as is quite well known, well, so uh, just to remind you, this this implies then that after some calculation, what we have, what we end up with is one or sixteen pi, and g here is is Newton's constant, which I'm going to s I'm I'm not going to worry about. Um, so let me just actually let me, let me just delete this, and we set it to one. So we end up with this equation, and uh, that is minus a half TAB, where TAB is a stress energy tensor, uh, and uh, and and so this ends up with this the famous equation, which says that GAB is eight pi TAB. And I'm, I'm going to ignore the right-hand side, mostly. So, uh, so this is just for, for completeness, so to speak. But uh, the structure of the stress energy tensor is, is very important, because uh, we want, uh, eventually we want to understand fields on the curve space-time. And uh, an example of, of uh, of a matter action would be uh, this uh, this one, which we, we, which gives a scalar field, and if you calculate uh, the stress energy like this, <coughs> what you end up with is TAB is. Like that, <clears throat> and so this is <clears throat> this is a scalar field. So this is just ordinary gradient here. 
you know, so no funny covariant derivatives involved. And, and the euler lagrange equation implies uh, in this case uh, that the stress energy is conserved. And the euler lagrange equation is, of course, the, the wave equation. So the wave equation implies uh, that the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation is conserved, and that's also a consequence. If you have a solution of the Einstein equation, uh, the coupled Einstein matter system, uh, the conservation of the stress energy ha is, has to be satisfied. And, and there is the, the Robinson -Bell Rosenfeld Bellinfanta theorem. Uh, which says that if you have a generally covariant, so diffeomorphism invariant uh, matter action, then uh, the, for if you look at solutions of the euler lagrange equation, then in fact the canonical stress energy and this symmetric stress energy that's defined like that uh, have to agree. So that's a, that's a useful fact. <coughs> okay. Um, and uh, just, well, uh, let me give one more example uh, of, a, of a matter action. Uh, and and uh, so ignoring uh, constants and so on, uh, for Maxwell, what you have is this. This is the action for, for Maxwell, FAB is... Is, is like this, and uh, the, the TAB up to some constant, which I ignore, is, is this. So this will play some, both of these will play some role later on. And uh, both of them satisfy the very important property that they, they have the dominant energy condition. D, uh, D, E, C. And so what this says is that T, A, B, uh, V, A, W, B is greater than or equal to zero for, for if, if V and W are future causal. Okay, and uh, this, in, this then, if you look, if you suppose that we have actually a solution of, of uh, the Einstein equation, then this implies, uh, since the Einstein tensor contains the metric, and if I plug in null vectors here, uh, this part gets cancelled. So this implies uh, if we have a, 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 a version of the Einstein equations that uh, the null energy condition and this says that RAB VAVB is greater than or equal to zero for all v which are null. Okay, and so if you have this positivity condition on the Ricci tensor, even in the Lorentzian case, you can do comparison theory uh, for 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 geodesics. Uh, okay. <coughs> uh, let's see now. Uh, okay, so I think I'll just start over here.
Okay. Um, so now, uh, so now we're looking at at the hypersurface in a space-time. This has a, a normal, which I also call T, and and this is uh, sigma is space-like. If T uh, is time-like, and uh, if if we're in that situation, then from the space-time metric, uh, sigma inherits um, a three-metric. Uh, and a second fundamental form, Kij. And uh, this uh, so th this this has the form uh, so if I take uh, well let me let me just write it like this. So this means take uh, take the covariant derivative of t in direction x and contract using the metric with y, okay? So this would be um, something along these lines. So uh, x a nabla uh, a t b y b, something like that, okay? Uh, and uh, so, so this is the second fundamental form. And together, uh, those uh, fields uh, encode the extrinsic geometry up to first, up to, sort of up to first derivative on the, on sigma. And uh, if um, so, let me also call R sigma the scalar curvature on sigma, uh, calculated from this this uh, this H. And, and then R A B equal to zero implies the following equations. And this is, of course, also known, uh, well known to most people. And so here we would have actually, uh, here I would have actually two row, which would be two T A B T A. TB if we're not in a vacuum space time and and the other equation is and and so here I have the the H covariant derivative so to speak or C, uh, sigma covariant derivative uh, and if we're not in a vacuum space time here I would have mu I which is T I A T A. So this is the space-like, time-like part of the stress energy. This is the time-like, time-like part of the stress energy. So this is the energy density. This is the momentum density, so to speak. <coughs> and and so if 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 I have uh, so uh, uh, if I have a sigma H I J K I J, where those are now simply tensors, that uh, s solving that solves this this constraint system, then this is called a Cauchy data set or vacuum. Well, let me just call it Cauchy data set. Okay, so. Uh, such, since if I take any any vacuum space time, look at a space like hypersurface in that space time, I get uh, tensor fields induced on that hypersurface that satisfies the constraint. Um, 
uh, then it's reasonable that we should be able to go the other way. And, um, and so if we're given a, such a Cauchy data set, we should be able to construct a space-time. Uh, and this is the Cauchy problem. And here, extending, I mean that in a precise sense. So uh, this, this M here should be a globally hyperbolic space-time, which is vacuum, in the, if we're restricting to vacuum, and uh, which contains sigma as a space-like hypersurface, as a Cauchy hypersurface. <coughs> and, uh, and the theorem is that There is a unique uh, up to isometries uh, maximal so this this is the solution of the Cauchy problem, and this is based. On the, well, so this was proven uh, by uh, Madame Chokebriha and, and, uh, and Giroch in 1969. And this uses the, this, uh, this um, reduction uh, technique that goes back to uh, the work also of uh, Madame Chokebriha in 1952. And so, and so I, I, I will sketch the idea of this, of the proof, because this is some, somewhat important. And the, the, the first observation is that the, the Ricci tensor can be written like this. And uh, this harmonic piece is. Um, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> ah. Like that, and and the v, will, if I raise the index, uh, is is that. Um, so this is, uh, uh, and uh, so th this you can you can calculate. This is just the 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 covariant. Um, wave operator acting on the coordinate x a so i'm i'm mixing i'm not i'm using uh, or in some sense a, a abstract indices without worrying about coordinate or other index types so this is but this you can make sense of this uh, and so this this is this is not a, a covariant object this is not a vector field because it does not, well, it does not transform as a vector field under coordinate changes. Um, so this, this is not the most uh, elegant uh, thing. But the point is that this object here 
this is a quasi-linear wave equation. And, uh, and the fact is that um, so if, if we have, so, so we, we, we're given, we're given uh, the, the Cauchy data and we can extend this to get from the HIJ, we can add components of the metric uh, which will be the, the time-like, time-like, and time-like, space-like components of the metric. And that, from that we can define GAB at, let's say, t equal to zero. So this is on sigma. Uh, and uh, we have the second fundamental form. And I, I forgot to say the second fundamental form uh, can also be calculated uh, like this, so uh, so the k i j is a half li time like normal g i j. So we take the 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 Lie derivative of the space time metric and restrict to the hypersurface. That gives also the second fundamental form. So this is essentially the time derivative of the metric. <coughs> uh, and and so from from the from the Kij uh, and choosing dt uh, laps dt shift in the appropriate way, we can make sure that the Va at time zero is equal to zero. Okay, and then uh, then a calculation. Uh, shows that due to the constraints we have that uh, that dt is also zero the the time derivative of this tension field v uh, the, you can identify this with a, a particular uh, with a tension field uh, of uh, uh, a metric such that this coordinate system XA is a Cartesian coordinate system in that for that metric. Uh, so so now we have that this is uh, uh, that the Cauchy data for this field V is trivial. So it's initial value zero, time derivative initially zero. And, uh, and then a calculation uh, using uh, the Bianca identity plus if we assume that this uh, this harmonic part of the Ricci tensor is zero. This implies, uh, well, no, let's see. Uh, so, okay, so, so the Bianchi identity, uh, yeah, okay, so. This implies that that the V itself satisfies the wave equation. So we have initial data, which is trivial. We solve a wave equation by, by uh, well-posedness. Uh, v is identically zero. In some neighborhood of the initial data surface. So this means that we actually solved not just this equation, but the full equation rich equal to zero okay so this is <coughs> this uh, this constructs from uh, from a set of Cauchy data a solution of the Einstein equation on some uh, neighbor on some small neighborhood and so one has to do a little bit of work to patch things up and up and so on but this is this is now the situation and this is uh, then now the, the remaining problem is to show that uh, 
the uh, extension is the maximal extension is unique and so I will I think I'll, I'll, I'll do that and then to end for the break <coughs> uh, so now what remains is to show so now we have some extension and what remains is to show that there is a unique extension uh, so so now the the set of extensions So there is a partial order on the, if you think about all extensions and, and sort of identify up to uh, isometry, uh, you can introduce a partial order simply by inclusion. Uh, and, and so then by Zorn, there is a maximal element. and call this M. Uh, now, I, I know, so I think recently there's been some work to de this argument, but I don't know that argument, so this is the, the old version. Uh, so there is a maximal element M. Now suppose there is another maximal element M prime, okay? And, and let, let U be the maximal common domain. So, so the picture is, uh, that we should have in mind is, is like this. So here, here, is, here is sigma, uh, here is U. And then after some, after some point, uh, there, there are two different uh, uh, extensions. So, so, so one, of these is, one of these is M, the other one is M prime. And, but U, has, U is not the whole thing, but it's maximal, so it, uh, by assumption, okay? And now, so here, here is the boundary of, of U. We pick a point, let's say P hat, in this boundary, and we come up against it with a Cauchy surface, and then we apply uh, the local existence result, which says that I can uniquely extend this at least into some neighborhood. But this uh, uniqueness and the fact that we assume that u is maximal uh, gives a contradiction. Because now we show that u is actually, uh, has actually be become larger. So this contradicts the existence of another extension which, uh, which fails to be uh, isometric to this maximal element m. And so this gives the uniqueness uh, part of, of the theorem. Okay. And, and it, it's, it's, it's important to know that there are non-trivial space times. I mean, I gave one example, which is this interior of the light cone, where you have non-unique extensions. But there are other important examples, like the, the Taubnat spaces, uh, where you have one part of the space time, which is globally hyperbolic. Uh, you have a smooth Cauchy horizon. And you can actually show that you have uh, non-isomorphic vacuum extensions of, the, of that space-time. And this is, this is an example in the Bianchi family of, of space-times, where it's known that uh, in, for a generic such space-time, uh, extendability fails. So this is precisely an, an example where strong cosmic censorship can fail for particular space-times, but holds uh, generically. Okay. Yeah. 
uh, you mean geodesic com completeness. Uh, well, then uh, um, in you're asking about uh, whether it's then unique or I, I, would, I would doubt, I, I don't know. But this is a kind of a funny, well, I mean, it's a, it's a good question, but it's, it's not, it's a, from, coming from a different perspective because what you expect is that generically Cauchy horizons will be highly irregular. So if you take a generic vacuum space time, uh, as you approach the boundary, uh, curvature will blow up. This is what you expect. So, so uh, smooth, uh, so in, from that point of view, uh, it's rather, what you would rather want to show is, is some statement about the behavior of the curvature as you approach uh, the Cauchy horizon. And so, uh, and geodesic completeness is, you know, generically not true for the Einstein equations because of the, the focusing property of the, of the curvature. Okay. Okay, so we'll, we'll take a break there. Okay, so, uh, so let me start again then. Uh, so, so, I just, uh, so I just sketched the, uh, the proof of uh, existence and uniqueness of the maximal Cauchy development. And, and uh, something I, I, I glossed over is the um, is the fact that in 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 constructing this <coughs> we solve we have to solve a quasi-linear wave equation so so uh, we we have the Cauchy problem for the quasi-linear wave equation one has local existence and uniqueness um, and uh, so. Uh, So a very important uh, fact is that if if we look at this this uh, this uh, harmonic uh, uh, version of uh, so let me well so uh, so it's So this is some some quadratic expression in first derivatives, and uh, and uh, I won't write it out in detail. But an important fact is that the SAB has contains terms uh, like that. So here are some indices which are being contracted, but we have the free indices are. Uh, on the outside, so to speak, and um, it's uh, it's a well-known fact to, to some people that uh, that uh, that if we have a wave equation which has on you know, if we're on Minkowski space, if we look at the wave equation, at the wave equation of this form, then, uh, then uh, we have, for, for small data, the solution extends globally. So small data means that there, I put some epsilon uh, multiplying the, the Cauchy data for this wave equation. So the Cauchy data would be psi at at t equal to zero is psi zero dt psi at t equal to zero is some function psi one. And I put an epsilon here and make that epsilon as small as I like. <coughs> then for small data, there is a global solution if this q has the property that that if I insert uh, a null vector, uh, that should be canceled. And so that, that means that the, 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 the worst interactions in this non quadratic nonlinear term uh, are canceled. 
and one can then show that, uh, that you have global existence. On the other hand, if I take something uh, that, that fails to have the null condition, for example, uh, the, this equation uh, if I take just the, just the time derivative squared, for example, then uh, we, have, we can have blow up for small data. So this, this goes back to, to Fritz John, and, and, and so this dichotomy, so to speak, between uh, equations which have null condition and equations which fail to have null condition is, is very important. And, and in fact, uh, here it seems as though the Ernst equation fails to have the null condition, and this is, this is in fact true. But it, uh, so this, this uh, so the null condition fails for, for the Einstein field equation. This is just a fact of life. But there is a, there, but there is a weak there is a, a weak uh, null condition which does hold in if you uh, if you work in harmonic coordinates and you split the metric uh, according to certain, uh, according to a null tetrad, um, then, uh, then the weak null condition holds. And, and to illustrate the weak null condition, we can just consider a system like this. So, uh, so let, me, let me put the box is just the, the, the Dallin-Bersion here. So, so box, uh, let's say phi is equal to dt psi squared and box um, psi is equal to zero. So this, this system uh, has clearly doesn't have, does not satisfy the null condition because this quadratic form uh, is, is not, or doesn't have the required property, but it does satisfy the weak null condition. And the reason is that it, you can think of the, the, the phi system as simply as driven by the psi system. And the, here I put the psi system as just a, a free wave equation, but I could also put here some some QAB, and it would be the same. So this system you can show has has uh, global solutions for small data, uh, even though it fails to have the the old style of null condition, so to speak. And and essentially this this observation plus a, a, a lot of really deep ideas apply to uh, the Einstein equations uh, to, to prove uh, that Minkowski space is stable. Um, and this was first proven by, by uh, Christodoulou and Kleinemann uh, in a very massive work and then using the harmonic coordinate condition and this hyperbolic reduction uh, by Lindblad and Rodniansky. <coughs> Uh, so that's that's one one remark. And so this, if we're if we're going to understand uh, something about nonlinear stability of black hole space times, uh, one has to understand how to make use of such an observation. And this is really all I'm going to say about that. So I'm I'm really f going to focus on on linear uh, problems. But this is uh, this is um, something that together with the, the algebraically special nature of the curve space-time. Both of those uh, f facts have to come into play. Uh, another remark is about gauge source functions. So, uh, I mean, so we, we now took the, we, put, we made the, the Ricci tensor into a wave equation by setting V, the tension field V equal to zero, but we can set it equal to some collection of functions which depend on, on the coordinate and uh, and the metric tensor. 
uh, and this still uh, making that substitution still gives a quasi-linear wave equation, and we can use the, these gauge source functions uh, in, in an appropriate way to, to add damping and so on. Uh, and this has been used uh, to great effect by, by Hans, Lim, Hans Ringström, for example, uh, and many others. And it's also something that plays a big role in numerical relativity, where these uh, gauge source functions are designed to, to make the metric uh, behave well in the chosen coordinate system. And a, a slightly more sophisticated version of this scheme is, uh, is you can get it by defining um, uh, something like this. Let's see here. If I, oh, sorry. So I define, uh, so I take any vector, any vector field of one form, psi, I define V by this expression where nabla hat is some, is the, for example, it's, it's, it could be the Levitivita connection of some background metric. Uh, and uh, this, you can think, this fits into this scheme. Um, and so this is a slightly more sophisticated uh, version of, of, the, of the gauge source function, which, and this, this is actually now a covariant vector field. Uh, and uh, an application of this uh, if is the following. So if we take, let, let's define uh, the equation D Ricci at G on H, uh, t this is just d by the epsilon uh, at so we have some so we have some some one parameter family of metrics and uh, and so this is just the the, the pressure derivative of the uh, Ricci tensor in the direction of the tensor h and uh, if we choose uh, gauge source functions in this way, uh, picking uh, now picking uh, the 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 nabla hat, the background connection to be uh, so so uh, so we set g hat uh, equal to g of epsilon nabla hat is nabla of epsilon at at epsilon equal to zero. So, so this is now the background uh, connection. And then what you find is that uh, uh, this equation imposing uh, the linearized version of This implies that that um, that d Ricci at d hat equal to zero. This is the same as as and now this is the hatted uh, the background. Uh, Riemann tensor. So this means that, that uh, the linearized Einstein equation in, harmoni in, in linearized uh, harmonic coordinates is, is simply this uh, nice wave equation. But this is co a covariant wave equation. There is the Riemann tensor, uh, even though this simplifies a lot in, in, for example, in Kerr, it's not 
obvious how, how this can actually be used. But this is one, one way to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to exploit this. And uh, <coughs> another, well, so, I, so there are several remarks in this context that I really want to make. And another remark is about tetrads. So there are many, many tetrad-based formalisms. Uh, so we introduce some collection of vectors and, and one forms uh, indexed by this underlined index. And, um, and, uh, and a particular example is, uh, is for example, an, an orthonormal tetrad so that G, A, B, which is by definition <coughs> so so that the tetrad version of the metric um, is just the diagonal uh, the the Minkowski metric that's one one particular uh, choice of a tetrad um, uh, another, uh, another important choice is a null, null tetrad. And so I, I'm going to use conventions which are uh, not the same as some, some, some conventions. Uh, but So by choosing a tetrad uh, which, <coughs> which is actually complex, we can make all of the tetrad legs null vectors. Uh, we can have two, two real null vectors and two complex null vectors. Uh, and um, and this, is, uh, this, is, this type of tetrad is very natural and important if you work with uh, spinner formalism, and which I'm, I'm going to do hopefully later on. And, and uh, a very important uh, fact here is that if you, if you in introduce a tetrad, <coughs> then, uh, then you, can, you have the Cartan structure equations uh, <coughs> so basically DE plus omega wedge E equal to zero, and D omega plus omega wedge omega equal to big omega. And, uh, and if we, uh, so this, this omega here would be something like this. So this is, this is a matrix of two forms. So these are form, two form indices. <clears throat> there, this is a matrix, uh, and this is this is then just encodes the the Ricci tensor, and if we have, in addition, um, the 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 Einstein equation, we can pull out the the Weyl tensor here, <clears throat> and uh, and in addition have something like, uh, let let me just write it like this. <clears throat> So this is very schematic. So, so first structure equation, second structure equation, and the Bianchi identity for the Weyl tensor. So th this, this system, as it stands, is a first order system of PDEs, which in some sense encodes the Einstein equation. Okay? And it, it, this fails to be hyperbolic in the same sense that the, the Ricci tensor fails to be hyperbolic as, as, a, as a partial differential operator on the metric. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the point here is that you can equally well introduce gauge source functions in this context. Uh, and here, the gauge source functions
just schematically would be uh, the first, which we recognize from the, the harmonic coordinate condition, uh, and the second, which have this particular form. Uh, okay, so so yeah, so the 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 only three indices are the underlined uh, tetrad indices, uh, and so by setting those functions to suitable expressions, uh, we can get a hyperbolic reduction of this system, and uh, and. And, and the, the, the important and curious fact is that uh, if we set, in this context now, if we, we set the f a, f a, b, those can be functions of, uh, well, the, the coordinates, the basic field, the connection forms but also of curvature. This, this gives us a, a, a first order So this is the system. Hmm. So, so this uh, this Cartan system, uh, Cartan and Bianchi system, so to speak, uh, can be treated along the same lines as the as the equation Ricci equal to zero, but uh, the difference is that uh, that by going to that length, you can actually have curvature as part of the gauge source function. So this is a very big difference, uh, and it's almost unbelievable in some sense. I still have trouble believing it, uh, that, you can, that you can do this. So this means that you can essentially uh, manipulate uh, the, the curvature tensor as part of your gauge uh, conditions. And, um, uh, in, if you look in Chandrasekhar's book, there is the, the phantom gauge. And this is an example of precisely this sort of thing, uh, but at the, linearized, at the level of linearized gravity. <coughs> okay. uh, let's see. Okay, um, so I think, okay, so we'll see how far I get. Uh, <coughs> so another, uh, I mean, so th these are all, these are all remarks. So we're interested in, in, in asymptotically flat uh, uh, or isolated systems. And so it's natural to look at Cauchy data, which have a certain 
uh, fall off at infinity. So, so, and this is, I'm not giving any details here, but this is the typical behavior. Uh, and uh, if we look at, uh, if we look at the relation between the time like, the time derivative and the time like normal, uh, uh, this is, uh, that's, that is given in terms of the lapse and shift. And, and if we suppose, for example, that that lapse goes to one at infinity, then, then that means that, that the Cauchy slice sort of marches forward in a nice way like this. Uh, and uh, in, in that case, if you, if you impose such conditions where the lapse tends to a constant at infinity, you start from the Lagrangian, uh, you do a Legendre transformation, and you calculate the Hamiltonian uh, that generates the, the motion, the evolution of the fields. Then you find that this, this Hamiltonian is of this form. Uh, um, so let me just, something, something along those lines. Uh, well, let me just write it like here. Uh, so, so there's there's a so so these the these this H here is uh, up to a sign. And, and uh, the J is also up to signs the same as the constraint. Uh, uh, something like that. Uh, so, so these these are zero. Uh, if you're if you're actually looking at the solution of the Ashton equations. But uh, they are not uh, they are not identically zero. So when you calculate the Hamiltonian equations, Hamilton's equations from this uh, this Hamiltonian, uh, you they will play a role. And uh, what you find is that uh, the the scalar curvature contains a total derivative, a pure divergence term, uh, which is going to give uh, contributions if you have a lapse going to one at infinity. And this has to be canceled off by this ADM mass, which is this well-known thing. Uh, Something like that. So, so this is a, a surface integral around a sphere at infinity, uh, and uh, this precisely cancels off this bad uh, surface term here, and and that gives the the correct um, uh, evolution equations. And you also have, for example, uh, linear momentum and angular momentum can be calculated. Uh, so this psi here is simply the this represents the limit, limiting uh, behavior of the of the lapse and shift. So the lapse and shift give the components of this psi here. Uh, so the pi i j is this. Uh, well, I just.
like that. So that's the linear momentum and the angular momentum can also be calculated Okay, something like this. Um, and so this means that, in, uh, that the Cauchy data contains in it information about the, the energy of the gravitational field and also the linear and angular momentum. And uh, if, we have the, if we have a solution of an Einstein matter system which satisfies the dominant energy condition, then the positive mass theorem holds. And what this says is that this P mu is uh, causal. Uh, and in particular, um, uh, and, and, and in particular, the mass is greater than or equal to zero, and it's equal to zero is a rigid case, right? So, so let me not be too specific here, but uh, uh, so, so this essentially means that the mass equal to zero means that you're in, in flat Minkowski space, okay? <clears throat> and, and uh, yes. Now, uh, okay, I'll, I'll say two things on this on this theme. Uh, the f which I think is they're also extremely uh, important. So. So kids, this means killing initial data set. And a killing field is, is a vector field. Where this holds. Uh, now if we have Cauchy data for uh, so we, we have some Cauchy data. Uh, we can calculate, uh, and we suppose that we have solved the Einstein equations. We can calculate uh, at least the first derivatives of the metric. Uh, so we, we have some control on the ambient geometry. Uh, and let's suppose that we ha also have data for this, uh, for, the for, the, um, uh, for this vector field. And suppose that we have solved this wave equation. <clears throat> then we can calculate, and so we also have that RAB is zero and so on. Uh, then we can calculate. So th this, what I just wrote here, this is the same as two Uh, so this, these round brackets are for symmetrization. Uh, so I can calculate uh, something like this. Okay, so, so what you see here is that this symmetrized, uh, this is basically this symmetrized uh, covariant derivative. Uh, that tensor itself satisfies uh, a wave equation. So that means that if I have trivial Cauchy data uh, for this tensor 
at the initial hypersurface, then in the whole domain of dependence, uh, this tensor is going to be zero. So, that, so in fact, if we have killing initial data uh, so that this tensor has trivial Cauchy data, then, uh, then Xi is going to be a killing field in the whole domain of dependence. So, so, here, so here we have uh, sigma, and we have here uh, So that means that it, the restriction of that tensor to the hypersurface is zero, and also the time derivative. Then, in the whole domain of dependence, uh, here we have uh, that uh, that psi is a killing vector field. So this means that that Lie symmetries propagate. So, so the, the slogan is that Lie symmetry propagates. So th this is an example. This, uh, this fact allows you to look at symmetry restrictions of the Einstein equations uh, because, because of the fact that these Lie symmetries are propagated by the Cauchy problem. And you can also see this from, at least in certain circumstances, you can see this from the fact that there is a, the extension, the maximal development is unique. So that means that if, if you have a symmetry of the Cauchy data, uh, that symmetry is going to be propagated to a symmetry of the whole space-time. Uh, and so this, this allows you to look at, at symmetry reduced uh, families of space times, such as circle symmetry, torus symmetry, uh, homogeneous space times, and so on and so forth. So, this is a very important fact. Uh, this, the, the killing vector, f uh, sorry? Uh, that's more, that's more sophisticated. I mean, here, this is just very broad outline. And I mean, the, the, this, this ki the, the killing vector field can have some zeros or become null and so on and so forth. This, this, the general fact is independent of that. But the, the, the sensitive point is to, under what conditions can you actually get trivial data? Or where can you, when can you characterize that you have trivial data. And basically, um, a good situation is where the psi is tangent to, to sigma or where it's perpendicular. Those are the easy cases. But uh, I, I want to mention this because this is, uh, this, this is an example of a principle which also is valid for spinners. So if you have, instead of having a Lie symmetry, you can have a, a, killing, a spinner type symmetry. So if you have uh, you can replace this the statement here by saying that we have killing spinner initial data and the same type of result holds. And this, this in particular implies that algebraically certain families of algebraically special space times propagate under uh, Cauchy development. Okay? <coughs> and this is, this is relevant for, for uh, Kerr characterization and so on and so forth. Okay, another fact I wanted to mention so Kolmar integrals. So we have Ricci equal to zero. This psi is a killing field. Uh, so it's the symmetrized covariant derivative is equal to zero. And then you can calculate 
so, so this means that the only, the only part of the covariant derivative that is relevant is the anti-symmetrized covariant derivative. So you calculate, and this is equal to minus 2 uh, Ricci contracted with uh, the, the killing field. So this is equal to 0. And so here, here is, this is d psi ab. And uh, so this means that uh, if we dualize d psi, that's a closed form. So this means that d of uh, so so this means that this this uh, integral like that if we integrate this over any two surface. Uh, this is independent of the two surface. This is because the, the, the dual of this two form is closed. Okay. So so this uh, this charge integral this is this is this is uh, this is analogous to the fact in, in Maxwell theory that integral of f a b uh, the the sigma a b so I should well. Uh, Maybe I should put some d sigma a b here for good measure. I, I'm not. No. Uh, let me not be too specific. So, so if I take uh, a two-form integrate over a surface, or uh, the dual of the two-form integrate over a surface, if the two-form satisfies the Maxwell equation, so it's closed, closed, and also it's divergence-free then both of these charge integrals are, are uh, independent of the surface. And this is, this is, simply, uh, uh, this is simply Stokes' theorem, right? So, the, uh, and, uh, so, so these charge integrals are independent of the surface. So if we have Maxwell equation, which is like that and like that. So source-free Maxwell equation implies that we have conservation of charges. Uh, and, and if we have a killing field in the vacuum space-time, we have conservation of these charges. And those are called Comar integrals. And uh, if we're in a And if we're in a in a in an asymptotically flat the case, uh, then uh, then uh, if we take psi to be the time uh, the stationary vector field like that, uh, then integral of star d psi, uh, which is which is this, uh, we're up to a factor of one half. Uh, this is equal to a half of the mass. And if we take psi to be d phi, then again, uh, This is angular momentum. Uh, so I'm I'm not I'm not uh, giving the the complete expression here, but that can be uh, that can be f found in the literature. Uh, and the, the important point is that uh, symmetries. Symmetries of the space-time induce 
additional uh, induce, induced conserved charges actually for the not actually for the uh, for the gravitational field and so so not only do symmetries propagate but symmetries are associated with conserved charges and so so that means for example uh, if in an axisymmetric Then, uh, then uh, angular momentum is uh, sort of quasi-locally conserved. And what that means is that, uh, that we can take uh, we can look at, at an axisymmetric space-time with zero angular momentum. And this is not only a property that can be seen at infinity, where the, the ADM version of, or radio title volume version of angular momentum is calculated, but it's true for any two-sphere in that space-time. So it's actually a very strong restriction um, and, and essentially uh, limits the, the, the modes of the gravitational field. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, okay. So good. So so I think uh, so. I'll, I'll end. I think I have like ten, fifteen minutes, something like that. So I'll end by uh, by uh, uh, giving. Uh, so talking about the first example of a black hole space-time, which is uh, the Schwarzschild uh, space-time. Okay, uh, let's see here. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll end today by saying just a few words about, uh, about Schwarzschild, which is the, the spherically symmetric uh, black hole space-time. And this, this has uh, some of the features of, of Kerr, which is really the interesting case, but, uh, but no, of course not all of them. So, So this is the this is just the, the two sphere metric f is one minus two m over r and this m here is the ADM mass of the space time and this line element uh, uh, has a coordinate singularity at r equals two m as as everyone knows and it's 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 Ricci flat. <coughs> It's static, so dt is a killing vector field, and and dt is perpendicular. Uh, so it's it's hypersurface orthogonal. So, and in particular, it's perpendicular to the surfaces with t equals constant. Um, it's spherically symmetric. And by Birkhoff theorem, spher spherically symmetric vacuum implies static. Uh, uh, and uh, the R here is the area radius. So this is, if I take the area of a sphere, 
divide by 4 pi and take the square root. That's the area radius. Um, mm, a, a, a remark. So if we, if we set f to 1 minus 2m over r plus q squared over r squared, uh, then this is Reisner and Nordstrom. This is the this is Einstein Maxwell and uh, and uh, it has uh, uh, Maxwell form which is just uh, given by this relation here so so the charge uh, of that thing is So this, uh, this is just an example that one can easily extend this uh, to non-vacuum, but still uh, very interesting uh, space-times. Uh, and <clears throat> if we introduce the tortoise coordinate, this is uh, R star is so dr star is f inverse dr. And we set r star at 3m equal to 0. Then uh, this coordinate has the following behavior. So at, at 3m, it's 0. At 2m, where f becomes, at r equals 2m, f becomes 0. So this. Uh, if you integrate this, this blows up. So it diverges logarithmically and, and then grows linearly. So this is, this is the behavior of R star compared to R. So what, uh, and, and so R equals 2M, this is the horizon in, uh, actually, I mean, so at this stage we see it, it, it's a coordinate singularity, uh, but it's actually the location of the event horizon and Choosing uh, the introducing this new coordinate pushes the the event horizon off to r star equals minus infinity. Okay, uh, so uh, once we have this, uh, this new coordinate, we can introduce null coordinates. Okay, uh, and uh, what you find is that f goes like uh, plus or minus, minus e to the v minus u or 4m near r equals 2m. Okay, and, and this is, we can then uh, introduce new coordinates by writing this as a product now we have capital U and capital V, and those are simply these uh, the corresponding exponentials. So U is e to the mi uh, V is e to the V um, over 4m and so on. Okay, and and now uh, by making that identification, we can write the line element in a non-degenerate form. Uh, so this is some, some calculation that gives this result. And, and now you see that in here, in, the, in that form of the line element, uh, so the, the signs here, first of all, the signs here uh, 
represent uh, whether you're below r equals 2m or above r equals 2m. So there is a certain sign choice that has to be made. Uh, but uh, so th And this, these coordinates can then be extended uh, for all values of r. And, uh, and so we have now this, uh, this non-degenerate form of the line element, and that allows to give a maximal extension of the Schwarzschild space time. <coughs> So, there we can find a certain conformal factor and, and map the, the Schwarzschild space time uh, onto something like this. So, this is region one. Region two, three, and four, and uh, so now I'm drawing. Uh, so, so the the coord the coordinates v and u are null. So I'm drawing those at 45 degrees, and and each point in this diagram represents a sphere. Okay, uh, and. Uh, <coughs> So what what do we observe? Well, so so the the t equals constant slices go across like this. There is a particular place here, uh, which uh, is called. So this 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 particular sphere here is called the bifurcation sphere. And this, this has the property in Schwarzschild that dt vanishes. In general, if you have a, a non-degenerate black hole space-time, this, this 4m here is, uh, this, uh, this is the surface gravity, which is in, in, in Kerr has some, some, some other value. But as long as the surface gravity is, is non-zero, uh, the space-time, uh, the black hole space-time, will have a sort of bifurcation sphere where the, the null generator of the horizon uh, vanishes. Okay. Uh, and you see here that, uh, that all the, in this diagram, all the t equals constant slices end up at the bifurcation sphere. And this is another aspect of the coordinate degeneracy in the original Schwarzschild coordinates. And this can be cured, for example, by looking at at other coordinates which cross the horizon like this. And, and uh, we note that the coordinate v, uh, as I move up to the horizon, t, the Schwarzschild t goes to infinity, uh, the tortoise coordinate goes to minus infinity, and in fact, v is regular across the horizon here. u is regular across the horizon here. Okay, uh, okay so I, I should finish very, very, very soon. Um, so, um, and, okay, so let me say uh, just a couple of things more. So this region one, this is the domain of outer communication. So this is the, the, the past of all future observers at infinity, and the future of all past observers at infinity. Uh, and this, this is the region that we're going to be interested in. And uh, you can calculate that, <coughs> that in region one, what you have is that if I take dv of the area of some two-sphere, this is positive. So as I push forward here, uh, as I push in the, in the v direction, 
the area of the two spheres increases. If I push in the negative u direction, so du area is negative in, in region 1. Uh, so if I push in the past direction, area increases. And, and as I will explain, this, this means that, uh, that uh, bundles of light rays converge uh, um, in the ingoing direction, but diverge in the outgoing direction. On the other hand, in region 2, uh, we have that both of those And so, so here, if we're in this region, uh, no matter how we push in the future along any null direction, the area of two spheres increases, decreases. And so that means that li bundles of light rays are actually uh, always converging in that, in, in that case. And this, uh, by, by uh, the ratio dura equation, uh, implies that you will ev eventually run into uh, an incomplete so, th so that null geodesics will, in general, be incomplete. Uh, and that, is, that then signals a uh, 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 black hole. So, so, this, so those surfaces are trapped. <coughs> and, and I'll explain uh, how to prove, well, I, I'll at least state some, some results relating to that uh, the next time. Okay, so I think, and, and so, yes. Okay, so one, one final f uh, statement here is, is the following. Uh, so I made, I showed that killing, in, killing initial data propagates. The Comar integrals tells us that, that axisymmetric uh, space-times have quasi-locally conserved charges, and so, uh, in, here, we are in a spherically symmetric situation, but uh, those two facts tell us that, that we can make a sort of Mickey Mouse version of black hole stability, which is to say that we take a zero angular momentum, axially symmetric deformation of Schwarzschild, uh, we let it go, it should converge to uh, another zero angular momentum static space-time, and this is some Schwarzschild uh, with uh, an a priori unknown mass. And this is, of course, no, this is not a Mickey Mouse problem. It's a very, very hard problem. But this is at least uh, uh, several steps below uh, curve stability. Okay, so, so let me end there. Thanks. Well <clears throat>